Welcome to episode 32 of the Cashflow Connections podcast. Our topic for today is how and why Brian Burke transitioned out of single family and into multifamily syndications. In this episode, we're going to discuss how the scalability of single family can be a significantly limiting factor, especially if you're trying to build a career in real estate. This is something that comes up a lot in investor circles. Even if you are the best single family operator in the world, it can still be challenging to own more than 10 homes, for example. And you don't really get to take advantage of some of the economies of scale that go along with commercial real estate and single family as well. We're going to talk about how our guest was able to reposition his strategy in order to take advantage of the opportunity in commercial real estate all across the United States. Of course, part of that is due diligence. So we're going to discuss some of the items on our due diligence checklist here when analyzing out-of-state properties, which is something that this team has been able to achieve at at quite a high level. And we're going to review how our guest found an absolutely screaming deal in a very competitive market, as well as some of the details of that transaction. All right. Now, I know I have withheld this for a little bit too long. The holidays got in the way, etc. But if you have been patiently waiting for the new CRE due diligence ebook, it is now ready for your reading pleasure. All you have to do is sign up for the CFC website as an accredited investor, and I will automatically send you a free copy. Now, of course, if you already have an account with CFC, just shoot me an email at hunterthompson at cashflowconnections.com. Be happy to shoot you a free copy as well. However, if you don't yet have an account and you're interested in reading some of the key takeaways for CRE due diligence, please make sure to go to cashflowconnections.com and sign up as an accredited investor. Once you do that, I will make sure to send you a copy of this brand new ebook, which is a transcription from episode one. Okay, I hope you enjoy the episode. How's it going, everyone? Today we have Brian Burke, who is the president and CEO of Praxis Capital, which is a privately owned real estate investment company. Praxis manages active syndications for the acquisition of single family houses, multifamily, and opportunistic residential assets in U.S. growth markets. Since he started in 1989, Brian has managed over 700 properties, including over 1,500 multifamily units. He has overseen more than $300 million in debt and equity for Praxis acquisitions, and their current portfolio exceeds $150 million worth of real estate under management. Brian is also a frequent speaker at real estate forums, including family offices and wealth management conferences. He is the co-host and real estate expert on the Fox News radio show, The Best of Investing. So, Brian, really honored to have you on. Thanks again for coming on. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, you know, before we jump into kind of the topics, I'm really interested to get your perspective, particularly as it relates to residential and multifamily over the U.S. right now. Let's talk about, you know, big picture. Uh, Tell us a little about your background and how you got introduced to real estate in the first place. Well, I started in real estate, as, as you said, back in 1989, and uh, I was barely out of high school then. And, uh, you know, I, I bought a single family home with the intent of renting it to my mother and, uh, and, and she, she had no place to go. So it was, uh, I didn't even own my own home. And it was an interesting experiment, both in real estate and family dynamics, and certainly one I wouldn't want to repeat, but uh, it, it introduced me to the concept of investing in real estate. And uh, it seemed like something that uh, was really a great way to build wealth over the long term and you know provide some uh, financial security in my later years. So once you get started in this business, it's kind of hard to stop. So just kept going with it. And a few years later, started doing flips. And then uh, you did a number of single family flips over the, a few year period. And uh, at the time, I was working full time in law enforcement. And uh, I eventually got to the point where my real estate business, or I should say my job was getting in the way of my real estate business and it came time to hang that up. So when I did that, I, uh, I, I started up a little investment fund. I, I told all the guys at the police station that I put in my two weeks notice and I'm going to tell you what I'm doing in real estate. And, and I got a bunch of guys that invested with me. And as I say, I, I ended up uh, coming out of a meeting with 28 investors with guns. So I learned I learned how to how to do this business right from the get go because uh, my life was literally at stake, and I had a great time doing it. And you know, continued through the single family flip business for a number of years. I've now done over six hundred and fifty of them. Um, you know, and and we've just grown the business from there. We uh, started in two thousand eleven buying single family homes as rentals. We did a, a large rental pool here in Northern California's Bay Area uh, that we're selling out of right now, and. Uh, 
you know, and then we turned our focus to multifamily where we've, uh, we've been really successful. And that's our core business now is investing in value add multifamily real estate all over the U.S. Got it. So when you, let's say, go back to 2011, because I'm definitely interested in that transition. Um, when you started in 2011 or so syndicating real estate, residential real estate, what was your bread and butter purchases back then? How are you identifying those opportunities? In 2011, uh, we were kind of doing two strategies at that time. You know, this was kind of the, in, in California, it was the heat of the real estate crisis was from about 2008 through 2011. So at that point in time, we were buying, fixing, and reselling about 100 houses a year here in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And then in addition to that, we were raising money to acquire multifamily properties in Texas. And we were just acquiring mostly foreclosed or in foreclosure uh, multifamily assets in the core Texas markets, um, pretty much 100 and 120 units and up was our bread and butter, you know, buying them, fixing them up, increasing rents and increasing operations and, and holding. Okay, got it. And so when did you start to make that transition into to multifamily then? It was right around 2011. So we were kind of okay. doing, we were doing three things at once at the time. We were, we were really deep in the flip business. But the, the thing was, is that we knew it was a limited lifespan opportunity. You know, there sure. were you know, foreclosures at, at, at a high volume were, were a unique dislocation in the market. And we knew that, all right, in a couple of years, this party's going to be over. What's next? Let's get geared up for that. And that's when we started buying our single family rentals in 2011. And that's when we started buying uh, multifamily in earnest in 2011. Okay. Got it. Uh, sorry, I missed that. This is the first time you said it. So when it when it comes to single family, how many properties do you currently own under management at this time in the single family sector? We've probably got about sixty or seventy left, somewhere in that range. We'd uh, we'd collected around one hundred and twenty, uh, and we started selling last year, and uh, we're about uh, you know a third to half the way through that process. Okay, got it. So these were buy and hold properties that you're now kind of exiting out of these particular ones that you have. Um, Tell us a little bit about the the sentiment of the market right now. I mean, obviously you're net sellers, but where is that coming from? Where are you seeing the opportunity if you're cycling out of the California, particularly in the Bay Area with residential? Yeah, you know, for us it was um, it wasn't so much of an investment as it was a trade. You know, we we saw that the market was at a bottom, an absolute bottom in 2011. You know, it bounced off the bottom in, uh, in 2000, late 2009, early 2010. Uh, and then it uh, did a double bottom in 2011, and that's when we recognized, you know, we had a true floor. The uh, you know the fundamentals supported, uh, you know, upside in pricing, and we made a prediction in 2011, and it was a bold one. We predicted that the market, the the housing prices would double over the following five years, and people told us we were crazy. We heard all kinds of things like "You're wrong." But, uh, you know, we stuck to our guns. We believed in our thesis. That's when we started acquiring those rental homes. And by God, here we are five years later and the housing prices have literally doubled. So the trade that we set out to execute had fulfilled our objective. And, and that's why we're now net sellers. Okay, got it. And, and just out of curiosity, what metrics were you kind of looking at to determine that, uh, that 2x in the five-year period? We were looking at uh, housing demand, uh, lack of construction, you know, historical home prices and where things had been, and just making some predictions on where we thought things could go. Sure, sure, definitely. And and do you think that the opportunity in California, you know, it, it from a lot of people that I look at, look at a lot of data, it seems to me to be that California, the mentality in the market is kind of changing. The demographics are changing. There's a lot of negative data coming out about income as well as people moving out of the state. Are, do you think that there's going to be an opportunity in California in the next five to 10 years? Or do you think that, that the volatility that we've seen is going to be a little bit more tame than what we've seen over the last three or four cycles? You know, it's hard for me to identify opportunity here right now. And that's one of the reasons why we're not so active here in California. You know, we have some unique opportunistic strategies that we put into play here, but you know, by and large, if, if I was a, uh, an individual seeking to purchase a single family home investment and I had short term objectives of having some kind of upside and, you know, immediate path to wealth, I, I would think that that strategy's 
probably not going to produce the results that you're hoping for. If, if you're looking at buying something today with the hope of holding it for 30 years and paying it off and having that give you retirement income when it's owned free and clear from, uh, from rentals, you know, I think that strategy is sound. I think it builds wealth. It's, it's a long-term strategy and you're going to have to accept the volatility in the, you know, in the market that will transpire over that hold period. So you got to make sure you have positive cash flow and can absorb, you know, some economic uh, hits. So I, I don't see a lot of real opportunity, but there is some, you know, kind of long-term upside. Sure, sure. So in terms of multifamily, um, where are you seeing the opportunity in that sector? Multifamily now is really a value add play. You know, if you can find a property that's just mismanaged, uh, underperforming, uh, you know, spe- especially ones where there's deferred maintenance and some physical things you can fix, that's where the play is. You know, there's still upside left in rents, but rents have made the bulk of the move that they're going to make, at least in the near term. So, you know, you can't rely on, you know, 10 to 15% year over year rent growth to be a way to, you know, build additional value into the property by increasing NOI through, you know, natural rent growth. Instead, you have to force that growth and, um, and, and be able to take an underperforming asset and bring it up to its full potential. So it, it requires a lot of additional work and uh, you got to be willing to put that work in if you want to see the upside. Sure. Uh, what markets are you, you focusing on right now on those value add strategies? We really have a pretty uh, wide path. Uh, our team here has about 90,000 units of multifamily experience at the partner level. Uh, so we've got a really broad footprint right now. And, and you know we've got experience in probably 40 out of the 50 states. But our specific focus in acquisitions right now is uh, in Arizona, Texas, uh, Georgia, Florida, the Carolinas. We own in in all those markets, except the Carolinas, we don't own there yet, but we're looking to. Uh, we're also looking at other markets like Colorado, Utah, Washington, Oregon. We don't own in any of those markets yet, but I do believe in those markets and, uh, and having a lot of tailwinds. Okay, sure. And, and so when you're looking at a property, you, you focus particularly on the value add. It, it sounds like the the more traditional value add in the sense of, you know, maybe putting in a washer dryer, maybe increasing rents is not really your main prerogative, but decreasing expenses, these type of things. What are some of the metrics you use to identify those opportunity? Obviously, there's a lot of competition um, in these really desirable growth markets. So how are you able to identify that from a data perspective and then make offers that are competitive? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and in actuality, we really are looking to increase rents, but just not through natural rent growth so, so much as we are through uh, you know, adding additional value to the property. So you know, what we're really looking for is you know, on the physical side, we're looking for a property where you, know, you love a 1980s uh, apartment building where you walk in the front door of the unit and it looks like it's 1980 all over again. You know, those are the ones where, you know, you can add some immediate value by making those things look like it's 2017 on the inside. And on the outside, you can add amenities that people are expecting in in a community living today, such as dog parks, outdoor kitchen and grilling areas, you know, uh, sprucing up the swimming pool, exterior paint, you know, just various things that you can do to enhance curb appeal. And also to enhance the the residents' experience when they're inside their four walls. That's that's our main focus. And how we do that from a data perspective is we're looking at what the rental rates are in nearby and competing properties that are in a similar condition to where we would intend to have our finished product. And and looking at the delta between you know, what that product is renting for and what the subject property is achieving in rents at that time. And when you can recognize that there's a significant delta and you have a, a clear path to take this property from where it is today to what those competitive set is doing, you know, that's when you can see that you're, you're creating some substantial value. Yep, absolutely. So um, when you're looking those metrics, uh, what are some of the resources you use? Is it websites, you go on site, secret shoppers? 
what are you doing um, in that preliminary stage just to identify that differential there? There's a few different things. Um, you know, there's subscription level data services that are out there that do rental surveys of apartment communities where they literally call all the uh, properties all over the U.S. monthly and get data on their rental rates and occupancy and so on. And they make that data available to their subscribers. So we do have some subscriptions to that data that give us insight on, uh, on what other communities are priced. Uh, in addition to that, we use uh, the apartments, uh, the properties uh, websites themselves. So, you know, typically you go to uh, apartment buildings will have their own website and on that website, they'll publish their rental rates. And we don't know if they're actually achieving those rates or not. That's a little bit tricky. You know, they may be uh, putting that on their site, but maybe no one's actually paying that. So we've got to get to the bottom of that. Right, right. Free month if move in, those type of things, concessions, et cetera. Exactly. Or they're pu putting it on at, you know, a thousand. But, you know, really when someone walks in the front door, they say, well, you know, for you today, it's 900. You know, and you just don't know what's yeah. going on behind the scenes. But, but really the meat of, of the work and, and where we really stand apart, I think, from, from a lot of buyers is we take the time to visit each of those competitive properties and tour those competitive properties and look at the condition of, uh, of those units and see how they compare to what our units would look like after we finish our value add enhancements. And we really study you know, what those rents really are, what they're really achieving and what you're getting for that money. And, and then we do a really thorough analysis to determine where our rents would land at the end of the day. Got it. Got it. When you're looking at uh, underwriting standards, what are some of the rules of thumb that you kind of look at before going into the 100% details fully and analyzing each opportunity? Where do you kind of pinpoint each property's profitability? You know, it's funny. I've um, we've probably analyzed I don't even know how many thousands and thousands of multifamily properties, and you know our ratio of buying is was literally where you know we probably look at a thousand properties to underwrite a hundred properties to tour ten or make offers on ten to buy one. I mean, it's it's a really intensive process, and in having to do that, you know, you know the the initial screen has to be very very simple and take literally less than 10 seconds. And to us, that initial screen is, does the property fit into our box? In other words, we're looking for class B uh, and C plus real estate, you know, in a market that we're interested in owning in, that's over a hundred units, preferably over 150, that's priced somewhere, uh, you know, our belief is that it would be priced somewhere between 10 and $25 million. Uh, it, it, you know, and if it's, it's built 1980 or later, and if it doesn't meet any of those criteria or all of those criteria, um, then it gets canned and, and then we go to the next one. So that's kind of the first high level uh, thing that we do. From that point, there is no, you know, rule of thumb. There's no bright line test. There's no back of the napkin uh, for us. Uh, you know, what we want to, we, we then launch into a complete and full detailed analysis on the rent roll and the trailing financials of that property and begin making our comparisons. And we literally analyze on a very detailed level, every one of those properties that fits into our box. And they don't get ruled out until such time that we've done that full analysis and realize that there's not enough upside for us. And you'd think there's a more efficient way, but uh, there's really no way to do it without having things slip through the cracks. Yep. That makes total sense. And by the way, I mean, looking at that amount of deal flow, that's a, just a tremendous amount of work that you guys must be doing. When you pull financials, do you, uh, do you pull the trailing 12? What do you focus on the trailing 12, trailing three, three years? What's kind of your, your rule there or all of the above? All of the above. We have a very sophisticated model. And so we look at, uh, we actually do a line by line. We, we categorize, recategorize, I should say, all of the income and expense items into a format that is um, consistent among every property that we're evaluating. So, you know, we may take a, a detailed trailing 12 from a buyer and move their line items around to fit the categories of the way we underwrite. And then we do a line by line, side by side comparison 
between uh, the properties trailing, trailing 12 performance, trailing three month annualized income with trailing 12 expenses, the broker's pro forma, and then our own analysis of where we uh, think that those income and expense items are going to be. And we compare each of those side by side to make decisions based upon all those different factors, plus our operating history of our other properties and our experience to figure out you know, what those income and expenses will be once we take title. Yeah, I really appreciate you kind of going through that explanation. For the listeners out there, obviously, it's hard to you know, take that piece of information and you know, make that actionable because a lot of what he just described has a lot to do with experience. And so it's challenging to, you know, base, base just that assumption on where you can buy a property, but at the same time, that's the entire process, right? So it's interesting. So you really just have to do this stuff in order to accomplish it. Um, you just have to look at the financials, look at the broker's pro forma and, you know, make assumptions and then close deals and see you know how things play out. And that'll, that is the only way you're going to learn how to do it, uh, to be honest. So I appreciate you going into that level of detail. Um, you know, I, I want to get an idea of kind of your most recent property. Um, could you walk us through what the most recent property was that you purchased and just a little bit of details as far as the age of the property, the, the thesis, et cetera? Yeah, we, uh, our most recent closing was uh, about a month ago. We bought 232 units in Tampa, Florida. Uh, the property was built in 1986. It was 96 or 97 percent occupied, owned by uh, 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 kind of a mom and pop shop that uh, had owned the property for about seven years. Never really did much to it, and the prior owner to them hadn't done a lot to it either. So a lot of the units were still in original 1980s uh, vintage condition. A few units had a few things done to them. You know, the exterior looked pretty good, but. Um, you know, the interiors just needed quite a bit of help. Uh, we purchased that property for just under $19 million. And um, <clears throat> about uh, two or three weeks before we were set to close escrow, uh, Hurricane Irma blew through uh, right in the middle of when we're raising capital for the deal. And imagine, you know, uh, you've got all your investors that are uh, considering investing in this opportunity. And now there's a hurricane bearing down. Uh, ready to, uh, you know, impend mass destruction upon the state if you followed what the news was saying. So it was kind of an interesting and trying time. You know, it just kind of goes to show that these things never go according to plan. They never go smoothly and you have to be prepared for almost the unthinkable. At the end of the day, you know, the hurricane would pass by. There was no damage. You know, investors uh, ended up getting comfortable and we got the deal closed on time. So it was a, it was a really fun experience if you like to be challenged. Totally. Uh, did you mention the cost per door on that one? Uh, yeah, it was about 19 million. So I, I think it was around 80,000 a door somewhere in that range. And, uh, you know, which, you know, was a pretty darn good deal considering that uh, just a couple miles away, a very similar property came on the market while we were in escrow for 120 K a door. Uh, which uh, it made us feel a lot better about our purchase. That's for sure. Wow, that's pretty. That's pretty screaming. That other property that came on the market with this similar vintage, similar vintage. You know, similar layout, similar unit count, everything. I mean, you know, we went to go look at it because we thought it would be a great addition to the portfolio. And then when we found yeah. out what what the seller was uh, targeting on price, uh, you know, we were just uh, uh, we were blown away. We it was a great example to our investors of what the potential was for uh, the performance of our investment. Absolutely. And and you mentioned that the specific, the value adds really coming from a lot of those interior renovations, really bringing the property up to the 2017, 2018 standards. How much rental increases do you think are going to be derived from those renovations and increases? Well, you know, it's funny. The first part of what you just said is what we thought, you know, we thought the value add was really going to come from interior renovations and bringing the rents up. And we forecasted that we'd be able to bring those rents up about $275 uh, from where they started, you know, which, you know, in apartments that average, you know, 900 bucks a month. Or yeah, that's you know, really that's, significant. That's a and significant almost unheard jump. Of. <laughs> yeah, almost yeah. unheard of. And, you know, as some of our investors were like, yeah, right. You know, how you think you're going to get those rents? And we're like, well, you know, the comps support that. 
Wow. Uh, and, you know, we're going to do a nice job. We're going to spend $6,000 a unit and we're going to achieve this, uh, you know, $275,000 rent. Pump. And, you know, we, we believe that we can do it. And so that's what we thought the thesis was. Well, in the subsequent 30 days, we found out that we were, we, we kind of missed the mark a little bit. Uh, we haven't even started our renovation yet, and we're already renting out units at our fully renovated price. So it's uh, it's become apparent now that there's even additional upside beyond what we had even imagined that there would be. So, you know, we captured this upside with just, you know, better management and that sort of thing. So it was it was pretty incredible. Wow. That sounds, you know, that that is a very unique profile um given where we are in the cycle that's that's great to hear that's that's awesome um you don't find a lot of deals like that especially with 100 plus units it's challenging because people are looking for those <laughs> obviously yeah you don't but we do i mean you know that's the thing is you know we we look at so many opportunities we have such a deep level of experience on this team we find this stuff and this isn't the first and you know, only example of, you know, a property that's gone that way for us. It's just a matter of being very patient, uh, you know, waiting only for the right opportunities and then executing very, very well. And, and you know, that's that last piece is a, probably the most underestimated component is that people think that, oh, I can just buy this property and, you know, I'm going to be able to do what everybody else is doing. But you know, you, you, you've got to be able to manage it right in, you know, having, um, 90,000 units of multifamily experience makes a big difference in, you know, the ability to succeed in that, in that side of it. Totally. And I agree completely when you said, you know, it, it makes sense from a big picture perspective, you understand the thesis, but the execution, not only is it the, the people put less credence to it, it's also by far the most important. And so, you know, that that's really interesting. And it's that's awesome that your guys have been able to source deals like that, you know, on a consistent basis. Um, from a from a cash flow perspective, what do you anticipate the year one cash flow looking like for this deal? <laughs> well that's that's a great question because uh we haven't gone back to reevaluate our thesis. You know, initially yeah. I think we started out with a six percent forecasted year one cash on cash return you know, increasing, you know, over the hold period to uh, about 11 or 12%, you know, and then of course, depending on how long we hold it and, and so on. But, uh, you know, given what we've seen, I have a feeling that those projections are, are going to be, uh, I guess we should say somewhat conservative. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, the The property management company that you guys are using, is this someone that you guys have used before? You have other properties in the market that you've kind of been able to leverage them in terms of economies of scale. What does that look like? Well, uh, in the past, we'd, uh, we'd been using third-party property management companies that, that we've been working with for a, a significant period of time. When, uh, when we recently expanded, you know, we were pretty much focused only on the Texas markets up until about a, a little over a year ago when we started turning our attention to, to uh, maybe two years ago to, uh, to other markets. And, you know, in our efforts to expand, uh, we've now expanded our team internally and, and now we've uh, created our own management company. We've gone vertically integrated. So, you know, we now have uh, the, the CEO of the management company, that our wholly owned management company. Uh, came here with 37,000 units of multifamily management experience, uh, had started up national multifamily management platform six times for some major, major players. And he's come on board our team, uh, you know, and that's that's changed the game for us. We've, we've now been able to take that management in-house and now we've captured 100% control of our own destiny and that's made a substantial difference in our business. Totally. Totally. I like hearing that a lot, especially since you guys have such a, a wide net um, in terms of where you focused uh, from a market perspective. Um, let's talk about the debt briefly on these properties. Uh, you know, Obviously, the debt is an important part of any of these investments, particularly late in cycles. Uh, what does the, the financing look like on that deal in Tampa? Our financing frequently looks pretty much the same. So we use agency debt, which is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, I think that uh, on the Tampa deal, we had Freddie Mac was the winner. We put those two agencies against one another, and uh, we take the one that gives us the best pricing and terms. So we finance 75% of the purchase price. 
which we forecasted to be about 55% loan to value year two after we've um, you know, accomplished about half of our renovation. Uh, the uh, uh, interest rate was about three and a half percent roughly. We, uh, we tend to use floating rate debt, which may come as a surprise to people that see a low interest rate environment and maybe seeing some long-term advantage to you know locking in a low interest rate. Uh, those tend to come with very onerous prepayment penalties that for a strategy like ours doesn't work. Uh, you know, I, I always tell people that you know we're not buying to flip and we're not buying to hold, we're buying to watch. And what we do is we acquire, we improve, we bring up the income, and then we watch the market for the optimal point to exit that property. And that, that exit point might be most optimal in year three, it might be most optimal in year five, it might be year seven, it might be year 10. Floating rate debt allows us the flexibility to execute that strategy and exit any time that we feel that is the optimal point without the fear of having to pay a million or $2 million in uh, yield maintenance or defeasance costs to get out of the debt. So we focus pretty much exclusively on floating rate debt to allow us that flexibility. Yeah, thank you. I thank you for pre, uh, going into the details there. We actually, you know, that's something we haven't talked a lot about is taking advantage of those those flexible rates, but uh, makes sense, especially given your strategy. And, and you just mentioned your exit strategy is to sell. It's just a matter of really when and for what price. Um, you know, when it comes to praxis generally, um, would you say that that capital raising or deal sourcing, where do you sign on on those two sides of things um, as far as spending most of your time? Well, that's a great question. We we dedicate a lot of time to both. They're they're both equally difficult. You know, it's difficult to find uh, quality real estate to acquire that has the ability to uh, generate a successful business plan and a return that's going to attract capital. That's difficult in its own right, but it's also very difficult to grow a base of investors you know, $100,000 at a time or $250,000 at a time or whatever the case may be. So, you know, as a growing real estate firm, we're always looking for new investors to expand our investor base. And, you know, I was uh, speaking at a conference recently and, you know, the, the, uh, the guy putting the conference together asked me, he's like, you know, what's the one thing you need most in your business? And I said, well, more investors. And he's like, really? What do you mean? You know, you just raised $17 million. Why do you need more investors? And I said, because I just raised $17 million. <laughs> you <know>? Right. <laughs> you, totally. You know, you've got to continue to, you know, recharge the well, so to speak. So we have um, a senior vice president of investor relations here on our staff. His name is Bob Dreer. He's uh, his sole focus, 100% of his schedule is dedicated to communicating with new and existing investors. And that's all part of the business. You know, you can't buy real estate without money. You can't raise money without real estate. And you wouldn't go shopping at Macy's with your credit card if you didn't know what your credit limit was. So you need to know what you've got in an investor base out there. And that's what we're always focusing time on. <laughs> awesome. So, you know, just a, just a couple of questions that I wanted to wrap up with. Uh, do you have any advice that you could give to some of the listeners out there? So maybe some new real estate entrepreneurs that are just getting started. Anything like a key takeaway? I think the key takeaway is set your expectations properly. Don't go into this business thinking this is a get rich quick scheme where you're going to go and start you know, from absolute zero, never having done a real estate deal. And you're going to go out and buy a 250 unit apartment complex and become a millionaire. I mean, that's what I thought was going to happen when I started in this business. And it took me 20 years to buy an apartment complex that was something uh, that, that big. And certainly it doesn't have to take you that long. You could do a much better job than I did in ramping up your business. But set your expectations correctly so you don't disappoint yourself and give up too soon. Because if you keep at it, eventually you're going to accomplish your objective. What people don't do is keep at it. And that's where people fall short. Yeah, I think that's that's great advice. What are you most excited about for the future in real estate or otherwise? 
Well, you know, it seems like uh, from the time I get up until the time I go to bed, all I think about is real estate. So I better stick to that topic because I'm not an expert in anything else. Uh, sure. I, I think the thing that excites me the most about real estate is the opportunity for us to continue to grow. Uh, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, in the long term, real estate is the best investment out there. Uh, I think it's a great place for people to invest their capital. I think it's a great place for firms like us to, uh, uh, to use as a vehicle to assist people in achieving their financial objectives. And I think that, uh, you know, long term, there's a really good fundamental basis for real estate to hold up very, very well in a climate where other investment classes have a lot of unknowns. And, and given that I think our first objective is to protect downside risk, uh, I, I feel really good and I'm really excited about real estate's potential to do that if you do real estate right. Awesome. Well, Brian, uh, thanks again. Do you want to just briefly tell investors how to get in touch with you or where they can find more about you? I think the easiest way is to start at our website, which is praxcap.com. It's P as in Paul, R-A-X-C-A-P.com is short for Praxis Capital. That's probably the best place to start. You can see some case studies about some of the properties that we've acquired and, and what we've done with them and, you know, kind of follow, uh, you know, where they were to where we took them. And there's also contact information on there to, to get in touch with us or speak with Bob or any of those kinds of things to, to learn more about what we're doing here. Perfect. Well, Brian, thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. I really appreciate you having me on. Thanks so much for the opportunity. All right, listeners, thanks for checking out the episode. As always, the contact information for our guest will be available in the show notes page, which is hosted on SoundCloud, iTunes, and Stitcher. Don't forget, if you want access to some of the free goodies that I'm talking about at the beginning of these episodes, like free eBooks, weekly investor emails, and articles about some of the most important investment-related topics, make sure that you have created an account with CFC because this stuff is automatically available. You can do this by going to cashflowconnections.com and signing up as an accredited investor. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hunterthompson at cashflowconnections.com. Thanks again.